day is one of thanksgiving the world over. In Holland, it was 1945, and the war was over. VE Day came with all its excitement. Their Canadian liberators are fated, and ceremonies of thanks are held for delivery. And then in August, VJ Day. But victory in Europe and the Pacific meant another 18 names were added to the memorial clock tower on Queen Street. And returning soldiers, men and women, were coming home to an uncertain future. Niagara-on-the-Lake, with its beautiful sounding new century name, was a small town with big expectations. But war had changed things, as it always did. Camp Niagara, the military training ground, was no longer needed. Valuable factory jobs taken by women would now be coveted by the returning men. The farmerettes, those young women who had made sure the fields were sown and harvested, would also be unemployed. Niagara's pre-war tourist trade had already suffered due to the impact of the automobile and the creation of the new super highways. And then the trains stopped running and the steamboats stopped coming. The SS Cayuga, the last of the great steamboats on Lake Ontario, made her final crossing in 1957. She represented memories, lives, and tradition. And when she blew her last familiar steam whistle, it was the end of an era. But Niagara had always attracted passionate civic leaders, history buffs and entrepreneurs. They believed in the same thing, although perhaps for different reasons. Preserve Niagara's natural resources and bring back the tourist dollar. The ice storm of 1955 sliced away at some of Niagara's natural beauty. Over Niagara Falls tumble thousands of gallons of water to join a vast ice jam that stretches for nine miles. The appalling weather that has recently swept much of America and Canada has frozen this vast area of the Niagara River. Now the great mass of ice and snow has become a menace to buildings along the river bank. A custom shed is in danger, and the giant new hydroelectric plant may suffer as the ice is pushed on downriver towards Ontario. More than a quarter of a million pounds worth of damage has already been caused by the ice, which is 30 feet deep in many places. A small church awaits its fate as the ice moves on relentlessly. It caused thousands of dollars worth of damage to Niagara's pristine shores and beachfront. But the storm couldn't dampen the belief of many residents that if their town was to prosper, it had to capitalize on its history. In Virgil, the population was slowly increasing. The 1930s had seen the first 60 Mennonite families settle in the area. They came from the prairies, they came from Russia. Most were destitute. But when they arrived here, they were welcomed and given the opportunity to buy land on credit from a local citizen, Peter Wall. So they built farms. They built a community, a community that became an integral part of the fabric of Niagara. But tourism was still bleak. And then, in 1962, a Niagara lawyer and sometime playwright named Brian Doherty organized a small group to present eight weekend performances of two plays. Two plays by the Irish playwright Bernard Shaw. They presented these plays in the old courthouse building on Queen Street, and they called it A Salute to Shaw. Their audience liked it, and they wanted more. So the next year, they did it again. And this time, with more performances, and with Andrew Allen as their artistic director. Audiences came from south of the border and Ontario, and within a few years, the Shaw Festival was established. In 1973, under the leadership of Paxton Whitehead, it opened the Festival Theatre in the presence of Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh. And in 1980, with Christopher Newton as artistic director, the Shaw purchased the Royal George Theatre on Queen Street and established one of the great acting companies. The Shaw changed this town. Its world-class theater brought back an economy, a cultural economy. 
It encouraged the development of hotels, boutique inns, gift stores, restaurants, and major shopping outlets to serve the shore audience. Niagara-on-the-Lake became a destination for a new kind of tourist, a cultural tourist. A tourist who appreciated Niagara's authentic heritage, its majestic landscapes, its rare beauty, as well as the performing arts. Today, in the 21st century, Niagara is as unique as its landscape. You can find art galleries beside craft breweries, first-class dining surrounded by celebrated architecture, and award-winning wineries that have brought international recognition and curiosity to the region. During planting and harvesting seasons, Niagara's wineries provide employment to hundreds of temporary foreign workers from the Caribbean and Mexico. They bring yet another blend of culture and character to Niagara. In Queenston, you can find the only school for restoration arts in North America, Willowbank. It's home, an impressive example of classic Greek revival architecture of the mid-19th century. You can experience year-round living history at Port George, a Parks Canada National Heritage Site dedicated to history in the early 19th century. And you can have a different kind of tourist adventure altogether when you discover the power of the Niagara River from a whirlpool jet boat. In recent years, Niagara has seen a growth in annual music festivals that honor chamber music, blues, and jazz. And while we lament the loss of the steamships and railways, we now have a full-service airport and community transportation. Since 1895, all of this local history and growth has been documented and preserved at the Niagara Historical Museum. In 1907, the museum moved its collection into this building, Memorial Hall. And right here is one of the most important local history collections in Ontario. It all goes to show that a town with residents who are passionate, committed, and unafraid to take risks can rebuild, restore, and regenerate. My name is Christopher Newton, and I'm proud to have been part of the rebirth of this truly unique town.